All right, hi, I'm Sam Myers. I'm a physician and a senior research scientist at the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, where I research the human health impacts of large-scale anthropogenic environmental change. And the research that I think is most relevant to this symposium falls into three uh, different areas. One are the health impacts of rising concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The second is focused on global pollinator declines. And the third is focused more broadly on wildlife population declines, both marine and terrestrial, and their impacts on nutrition and health. Our CO2 work uh, was really in response to a handful of uh, small studies uh, in which investigators had grown food crops in chambers and greenhouses at elevated concentrations of CO2 and found that they lost uh, significant amounts of their nutritional value. And those results were sort of debated in the literature as to whether they were real or whether they were artifactual and the results of these artificial growing conditions and due to pot effects. And so we put together a group to try to uh, settle this question, including many people who are here in the audience today, as well as a group of agronomists from Japan, uh, Australia, and the United States who were expert in what's called FACE methodology, which stands for free air carbon dioxide enrichment. And essentially what they do is grow crops in these rings of carbon dioxide emitting jets. And the crops that are inside the ring are identical to the crops that are outside the ring with respect to cultivar, growing conditions, weather, pests and pathogens, but differ, differ only with respect to the CO2 concentration at which they're grown, which in this case is about 550 parts per million or where the world is expected to be in about 40 years. And when we combined data from all of these different experiments and gathered it together, we ended up with 41 cultivars of six food crops grown on three continents over 10 years, which represented a much larger data set than all the previously published data combined and really gave us the statistical power to answer this question fairly unequivocally of whether or not rising CO2 is threatening human nutrition. And what we found in a paper that we published this summer was that yes, indeed, there are uh, very significant reductions in iron, zinc, and protein in the C3 grains like wheat and rice. Uh, there are significant reductions in iron and zinc in the C3 legumes and less clear effects on the C4 crops. And the reason that that really matters is that there are around 2 billion people around the world who suffer from iron and zinc deficiencies today at a cost of about 63 million life years lost. And we found that there are almost 3 billion people living in countries that receive at least 70% of their dietary zinc and or iron from C3 crops like the ones that are losing iron and zinc. In a paper that we just submitted, we've now analyzed these zinc reductions by looking at dietary intake for about 170 countries around the world and looked at what would happen with these reductions if people continued to eat roughly what they're eating today in terms of the risk of global zinc deficiency. And we found that somewhere between 130 and 180 million people around the world would be pushed into the ranks of uh, zinc deficiency, most of those concentrated in Africa and South Asia, as you can see. We're also continuing analyses on iron deficiency and protein deficiency that relate to that. The second area that may be of interest is work that we're doing on pollinator declines, both local and global pollinator declines, and how they may affect health and nutrition. And essentially, we're uh, doing this by overlaying three different kinds of data. The first is uh, a global database on the uh, pollinator dependence of all the food crops that are consumed around the world overlaid with data, dietary intake data on what people eat around the world, and food composition data that says what's in that food. And when you overlay those kinds of data, you can actually start to model how declines in pollinators and pollination services might alter intake of micronutrients in certain food commodities. This is work from a paper we published last month in which we did a pilot analysis of four populations in countries uh, mostly in Africa and Bangladesh, and found that, in fact, there were significant increases in the risk of vitamin A deficiency, for example, in places like Mozambique and Uganda as a result of pollinator declines. And we've just 
submitted a follow-on paper that's a global analysis, again with about 160 countries, where we've looked not only at micronutrient deficiencies like folate and vitamin A deficiencies, but also at reductions in the intake of very important food commodities for health like fruits, vegetables, and nuts and seeds. And overall, we've found really large uh, health impacts, including up to 1.4 million excess deaths annually and uh, a very large increase in uh, burden of disease. The third area where we are working that may be of interest is looking at the impacts of um, human consumption of wildlife, both marine and terrestrial, and how reduced access to wildlife in the diet may actually cause public health uh, harm uh, and may not only be a conservation problem but also a sort of unrecognized public health problem. We've just completed a sort of deep dive in a three-year project in Madagascar looking at a population of 750 people uh, who have been recording daily dietary calendars for 16 months as well as giving blood samples and other biological samples so that we can look at the correlations between terrestrial wildlife or bushmeat in the diet and the status around micronutrients like iron, zinc, omega-3 fatty acids, B12, et cetera. And we actually just got funded last week to do a sort of to move that work to coastal areas and look at a similar set of questions around seafood consumption and local fisheries management, which will finally feed into a much larger effort that some of you are involved in, uh, bringing together fisheries ecologists, nutritional epidemiologists, and economists to model global fisheries management and how the choices we make about how we manage global fisheries may pay public health dividends or have public health costs. So as you can see, this is hugely interdisciplinary work. Uh, this is not my work. This is the work of multiple collaborators, many of whom are here, uh, who I thank. And uh, I'm thrilled to be part of this effort and looking to find lots of new collaborators as a result. Thank you.